Someone put it today, we did a park tour, and they said, you know, we're really in the memory business more than anything. Yeah, we manage the trees and the lakes and the woodlands and the deer. And, you know, we take care of the grounds and picnic tables and trails and whatnot, but it's really the people that make the park uh, come alive. And we're in this memory business, and some people have their family reunion here every year, or they have their annual uh, company picnic here every year, or they have their reunion or their Christmas party or something where they come on a regular basis year after year after year and they, they build these traditions. And they pass it on to their children and uh, as their children get older uh, they go off in the world and they come back with their children. So that's kind of neat to see this year after year of building of, uh, of good enjoyable experiences that become lasting memories. You know, the park itself was formed, the land formed, the landscape, if you will, uh, by the activity of the last glaciers. And there were glaciers here for you know, many millions of years, and there are several glaciers that moved into this area. But for the most part, it was the most recent one, the Wisconsin Glacier, that gave us what we have today. And it started to melt and recede about uh, 12 to 15,000 years ago. And in this process, it would still be moving in at the same time as it's melting. So as it moves in, it's carrying glacial till, rocks and stones and gravel and everything. And then it starts melting at the same time, so you get these build-up uh, areas of ridges and uh, mounds, if you will. Uh, and then there's, you get the gouging effect, too, or the bulldozing effect, that it would dig out what we call kettle hole lakes or kettle depressions. So here in Steuben County, we have more lakes than any other county in the state because of that activity. A perfect example is Lake James and Snow Lake. They're all kettle depressions. And then the little kettle hole lake would be our Lake Lanadal, which is out behind the Potawatomi Inn, a place where a big block of ice broke off from the major portion of the glacier and kind of melted away there, wedged in the earth and it melted away. And when everything else receded, melted, remaining was a small lake. Of course, Native Americans were all throughout North America, and in this particular area, the the most notable people, the most recent native peoples, were the Potawatomi Indians. <clears throat> Hence we have the name of our uh, Potawatomi Inn, and there's a Potawatomi Snowmobile Trail, and there's a number of things in the county that refer to that Potawatomi Indian history. And then uh, to take that one step further, there's a number of things in our communities locally here that have the Pokagon name. And Pokagon, Pokagon State Park, uh, that's the name of the last two most notable chiefs. And it was a father's son. Father was Leopold Pokagon. He was born back in the uh, late 1700s. And then we have uh, Simon Pokagon. Simon was born in 1835, uh, I think it's thought to be. And the uh, father's son and the leaders of the people, they were uh, orators. Uh, they were, Simon Pokagon was educated to a degree. And um, they settled in this area. And the fortunate thing for the Potawatomi is that when a lot of Indians were forced to move further south or further west, uh, the Potawatomi weren't uh, forced out of the area as other native tribes were throughout Indiana and southern Michigan. Uh, they were farmers, they took on the Catholic religion, uh, they married into uh, European families, and of course the Potawatomi became very assimilated and active in local culture and history, and so they were allowed to stay. So uh, still today we have descendants of the Pokagans that live along that Michigan-Indiana border uh, just to the west of here. So he was born somewhere around uh, 1830, 1835, and he's born in a small village over on the western side of uh, the state of Michigan, down low, kind of towards uh, State Road uh, US 12, on US 12. <clears throat> and instead, he's born in a sugar camp. And actually, there's a small town over there called Pokagon. You see it on the map. But that's where he's born. He grew up. Uh, say uh, he went to college, a couple different universities Notre Dame University, 
and Oberlin College in uh, Ohio and Twinsburg uh, Institute. But I've done some research and looking into it, there's no written records of him attending these schools. But it's, you know, there's no doubt that he had some kind of a formal education because uh, he was very educated and became this more of a modern day spokesperson for the Potawatomi people. They said that um, the entire area that the Potawatomi occupied is about three million acres and extended from uh, the Michigan border, the Ohio, Indiana border, across all the way around, including Chicago. And apparently that was sold for like three cents an acre, which is just incredible buy. It seemed like a lot of money then, I'm sure. And it took some time before the U.S. government gave the Potawatomi a deed to that property. And it took uh, Simon Pokagan a couple trips to Washington, D.C. to kind of finalize that. And, and the letters that we have, or the, the writings that we have, said he met two presidents. And that would be uh, Abraham Lincoln and Ulysses S. Grant. And that was that connection with our U.S. government. But through them, uh, apparently the Potawatomi were finally paid something for uh, the property that they gave in a treaty uh, back in the 1830s. Steuben County was uh, settled in 1830s. I know there's a little sign in Long State Road 120 over in Orland. They talk about Vestula, the original town. How it was uh, in the 1830s, I forget the exact date. But that's when that became established, the county. And of course, it was quite some time before it started filling in the county. But it was some time before that, though, the Potawatomi were uh, removed or moved on their own volition, if you will. The turn of the century is mainly farm ground. When you look at some of the old photographs that we have here in the park, uh, a lot of it in the 19 teens and 20s, there are no trees. And it's kind of hard to imagine now when we go out in our woods and there's forest, you know, everywhere. Uh, I think at one point it was mostly open grounds. You look at some of the old aerial photographs, you can see uh, farm fields, you can see fence rows. When you go out there now, you can still see a remnant of the fence row, but it's the big trees and things kind of in a linear fashion that uh, give you the clue that it was once a separate, uh, separated area between two fields. And then the three C's uh, planted some trees, but actually the Department of Conservation, prior to the Civilian Conservation Corps getting here, planted a lot of trees and a lot of evergreens. And of course the CCC were known for planting trees, they planted some in as well. The people of Steuben County got together and they raised the money to buy the first 500 acres. And they gave it to the state of Indiana as a Christmas gift. Can you imagine that? You know, today we talk about making donations of a sizable nature. And, uh, not everyone's in a position to do that, but, but some are. Back then, the people of the county realized what they had here, this beautiful resource and the need to preserve it for future generations. And so they got together and they raised that money. They sold bonds and then they turned it over to the to the state of Indiana on uh, Christmas, 19, or, uh, Christmas of 1925, and the park was born. The original end was built in 1927, and then we added on the um, Hoosier Wing in the 1960s. And that's the wing that goes from the present uh, like little uh, lobby, if you will, where the fish tank is, going to the east. And it was one story, and they did it in this kind of a yellow brick with a, with a red flat roof. And it looked kind of like all um, oh, the early schoolhouses, or the schoolhouses of the 1950s and 60s. It didn't have the same flavor that the rest of the end did. So what we did, well, two things before that. We went, put in the uh, swimming pool and the sun deck. That was in the 1980s, early 80s. And there's a sauna under there, and a whirlpool, and a nice swimming pool, and up on top is the sun deck. And then uh, the following year, we came back and, uh, well actually it was a number of years, we came back and put on the addition that we have today. It's that nice conference facility, it's got the breakout rooms down the sides of the hallways, nice new entryway, nice new front desk, uh, some office space, a big ballroom, and then some more guest rooms. And a lot of amenities that other state park inns don't have, like a laundry service, laundry mat, um, very extensive gift shop, very extensive recreation room, activities room. And back then, too, you didn't have uh, uh, bathrooms in each room. You had to walk down the hallway to use the bathroom and walk back. Now, in more uh, recent times, we've gone back and we've added bathrooms to those rooms. 
That's why if you're up in the historic wing, the historic section, you go into one of those smaller rooms and you, you have walk in almost immediately, step into the bathroom or step under the bed or step over to a dresser. It's just very, very tiny because they had to take out a corner of the room to put in bathrooms when they did. That was the first 700 acres and then we went on to add some more property and shortly thereafter we added up to 1,040 acres and it's in that 1,040 acres that the Civilian Conservation Corps did most of their work and you know we touched on it already the incredible work that they did and it's literally built Pokagon State Park the main shelters uh, the roads the parking lots planted trees and so it was through that effort that we made a lot of the changes there in the late 30s and early 40s. Uh, it, was a, yeah, it was a project that was um, part of the National Park Service and the Department of Defense, or Department of Army. So the Department of Defense and Department of Natural of, uh, Interior, they were the two parent organizations. And it was under the discipline of the U.S. Army, in the Department of Defense, but the work they did was under the auspices of the National Park Service. And that's why they worked in natural areas, uh, state forest, national forest, uh, the, whole, the whole list of them. The boys were here for six months stints. So they are here for six months or a year or 18 months or two years. And they are here from 34 to 41 or 42 is when they left. Now there are some boys that are so desperate to have a job during the Great Depression, they take the name of a brother or something and they come back in because, you know, they just love the work. And they really developed a sense of uh, camaraderie, developed a sense of uh, belonging, a sense of purpose, gave them a job, they had something worthwhile to do, they could see the results at the end of the day the end of their stint there. And that pride carried on too, because the last Sunday in July every year we have a reunion called the CCC reunion. And those who can come back, and last year I think we we're down to a dozen, those who can come back will tell stories and, and share information. And, and you can just tell it in what they say and how they say it and look in their face, how much pride they have in this. Uh, you know, to have a job first of all, to learn good skills and to do good work in an area that would be beneficial to generations to come uh, forever essentially. Uh, Beach, uh, that's another CCC project. And what they did down there, Trent, was they used um, uh, what was a cattail marsh, if you will. <coughs> and it was down uh, on the western side of the park along Lake James and Upper Basin. And they took out a sandy hill inside the park and they scooped it out in wheelbarrows and put it, loaded it in the uh, dump trucks. They took it down and dumped it in this marsh in the wintertime when it was frozen. And they even went out on the ice and dumped sand. And so when the ice melted away, that sand uh, dropped to the bottom. And so if you ever look from an aerial view, you see the beautiful sand beach we have today, and you see the square of sand out in the lake where they dropped it out there. Of course, that was done back in the 30s when we didn't have the different rules and things that regulated wetlands, and we had a lot more wetlands than we have today. You're right, we wouldn't be able to do that kind of project today without all the permits. Actually, probably wouldn't be able to do it at all. But back then, uh, it was a facility that um, fit well in that area of the park. And then what we got, what used to be a sandy hill back in the campgrounds, is now a big depression. And we use one hillside of that depression for our ski or for our sledding hill uh, today. So if you're here in the wintertime, it's a nice steep hill and there's parking right there and it's camping, uh, bathrooms, water. So, you know, who, who would have guessed back in 1930s when the three C's did that work, how decades later the land that they formed and reformed would be used as we are today. Yeah, the, the boys there were between the ages of 16 and 20, 21 years old or so, and they would bring in people from the communities who had certain skills, and they were called LEMs, local experienced men. And they might be a baker or a chef or a carpenter or a rock cutter or a mason or a bricklayer. Uh, plumber, electrician, and they'd come out and they'd work with the boys and teach them those skills. And they would come out and here at Pokagon with all these glacial boulders, there's a, a mason crew. And what they'd do is they uh, would take big stones, as we talked about earlier, those great big rocks, and they would crack them. And they'd use, first of all, a, a thing called a star chisel, which would make this drill, this hole in the stone. And then they would, uh, it had to be incredibly meticulous work, but they'd dig out this powder with a little tiny spoon. That'd be one guy's job, they got the powder. And then they put in these wedges, and they pound these wedges in there and crack these stones open and get them to more manageable size. Then they take smaller hammers and crack them and shape them 
to get them to the size that they needed to use in the rock walls, and the foundations, and in the chimneys around the park. So it was a lot of work. And when you look at the stones in the, uh, oh, the saddle barn, or down at the group camp, or even up at the gatehouse, which is a relatively small building, they're huge, huge boulders. And the fact that they cut those by hand, and the fact that they had to get them to the shape that fit just perfect where they had them. And when you look at the size of the mortar joints, they don't vary very much, within a half to three quarters of an inch. So that's pretty remarkable to get them shaped as accurately as they did. And then uh, to get those big stones lifted that high in the air, using just manpower or rolling them up a metal, uh, they call them stretchers, like a stretcher you'd carry a person in. They'd lean these things against the building and spin those up and put them in place. And I didn't have bobcats with you know, forklifts and buckets and backhoes and things. They had to do it all by hand. They built a toboggan slide. You know, the first one, wintertime, long winters. They didn't have the amount of work that they do this time of year, uh, or in the summertime or spring or fall. <clears throat> and they're boys, so they like to play. So they had the real nice hill over there uh, where we went out to the toboggan slide and a real long stretch of rolling hills before you get to the Potawatomi Inn. So they put in a very primitive slide at the time, you know, just a few feet off the ground and one track and whoosh, down they went. And then, you know, it got to be very popular and other people started noticing it. And so the property manager at the time, Russell Sprague, you know, said, you know what, this may be something that we could uh, develop here a little bit. And that they did. They developed the toboggan slide that we have today. And now, obviously, it's undergone several changes, about five or six that I know of. Probably the most significant was in the 70s when it became refrigerated. In other words, we have coils that go uh, underneath the track that send a freezer, freeze-on, freon solution through there. And that allows us to chill that concrete and then we just sprinkle it with a hose and ice builds on it. And once you get ice the whole distance, you're ready to go. Uh, wildlife, well, we had most of the common things you'd expect in a woodland environment, you know, uh, raccoons and squirrels and skunks and fox out in the more open areas, uh, chipmunks. You get down by the wetlands, you get beaver, muskrat, mink, uh, some weasels. Of course, white-tailed deer is pretty common throughout the park. Uh, then you have smaller mammals, the mice and the voles and the bats, things of, the, of that nature. Uh, occasionally we get reports of bobcat, haven't had anything confirmed, nor have we had anything confirmed with um, a badger. Those are two mammals that uh, conceivably could show up here at some point. Uh, that's the mammal life, bird life, uh, all the common ones you'd have in any woodlot. Chickadees, titmice, cardinals, blue jays, nuthatches, uh, several species of woodpeckers. Probably the most exciting thing recently is the big pileated woodpecker. This is a woodpecker, it's about um, you know, 12 to 15 inches tall, big flame red head. It's a beautiful thing. Big black and white patches on the wings and it flies. And then our waterfowl in our marshes and lakes, certainly we have those. Uh, very exciting too would be sandhill cranes, that real tall, ungainly bird with the long legs and long neck. Endangered species in Indiana. Actually, I think it's a threatened species now. But every year they occur down around Lake Lanadal. And we're thinking someday they may uh, nest down there. There's more and more nest in the county. And then hawks, red-tailed hawks, Cooper's hawks, broadwing hawks, sometimes nest at Pokagon. Um, some of the uh, other water birds like uh, gallinus or moorhens, Virginia rails, soar rails down in the wetlands. Marsh wren, it's related to the house wren that people may have bouncing around their backyards. We have a a wetland version out here called the marsh wren, which I also think is a state-threatened species. We have those amphibians, reptiles. We've got the state-endangered Massasauga rattlesnake that occurs out here. Don't get to see it very often, but occasionally we get lucky and see one. Uh, the Blandings turtle, another endangered species, uh, lives here at the park. Probably 10, 15 species of frogs, salamanders, amphibians. So quite a wide variety. That's the thing about Pokagon. We have variety of habitats. We have woodlands, both upland woodlands and lowland woodlands, as well as some pine plantations. We have old fields, we have open meadows, we have marshes, swamps, lakeshore. 
uh, your lawn areas like you'd have in town. So that real mix of habitats all within 1,200 acres really lends itself to a wide variety of animals and plants. Uh, nature Center has been here since 1980. We've kind of grown a nature center here. We have this little exhibit room here where people have been coming and going during the interview. And as you can tell, it's a busy place. You know, here we are, middle of winter, middle of the day, and there's people coming and going. And you know, we may only have a few dozen in here during the day, during the week. On uh, weekends, we'll have two to 300 people here. Uh, what we try to do in the exhibit room here is uh, show displays and exhibits of the resources at the park, the cultural and the natural resources. So the things we've been talking about already, the glacial history, the plants, uh, the animals, and then the cultural history. We've talked about the Potawatomi Indians and the Civilian Conservation Corps. So it's kind of a hub of um, informational activities, if you will. People come in casually and visit. We have school groups that come out, organize uh, scout groups, church groups. So that's the exhibit room. Then across the hallway there, we're doing some work there now, but we have the uh, auditorium. We do programs and activities. Uh, tomorrow, the local chamber of commerce will be having their meeting here. I won't be involved, but it's a place for them to get away. The same way as you know, campers do in the summertime, you have business groups. They come out here and they can meet, not be disturbed by the trappings that they might have back at one of their business sites. Bicycle trail, the hard surface bicycle trail. And that's been a huge success. You know, people really comment on how nice it is to have that. And what it does, it allows you to hop in a bicycle in the campgrounds and bicycle to the nature center, not be on the roads. Or bicycle uh, out to the front gate, or bicycle to the saddle barn for the nature center. And it kind of connected all these areas in a park in a safe way for cyclers to move about and not to worry about cars and trucks. You know, the people have their own stories, things that are important to them. And, uh, basically, if we can be a part of that and uh, facilitate them having a good experience, uh, of course, the idea is they have a good time, want to come back. That's what uh, brings money through the front gate and the pot of water in the end. You hate that, to focus on that, but you know, it's a reality of the situation with the budgets the way they are and things are very tight. And, they're probably as tight now as they've been in the 25 years that I've been here. And you pick up any paper any night and read about cuts that they're contemplating or uh, the hole that we're in. So we do our part here too. We're, you know, we're charging for programs now. We have for the last year. That's all new to us. And anything we do to in increase uh, revenue at the gates, you know, we like to hold fees down. One of the original philosophies in state parks in Indiana was that, well, two things: the user pays. So you're not counting on just tax dollars, but the people who come to camp and fish and hike, and take pictures, uh, they actually help pay for the, what they're experiencing. And the other uh, theory is to keep the fees as low as possible. So a family that maybe doesn't have a high paying job or a large family of meager means, you know, they have a place where they can go and seek recreation. So it's a real balance to keep prices down and yet keep the services that people appreciate. And uh, it's a real challenge, but hopefully we can do that. I uh, get to meet lots of interesting people. I mean, I've been here for 25 years now, so some of these people I've met over and over, and it becomes uh, like family. You know, they come in here and they say, oh, Fred, uh, we're back. This is year number eight, or this is year 18. And for them, it's, a, it's an annual ritual to come to the Potawatomi Inn and spend that first weekend after Thanksgiving or that spring break week or whatever. And so I find I've become a part of their experience. And that's, that's neat. And by being here so long too, you develop a sense of place, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, there's certain things I look forward to. There's certain wildflowers out on a trail. Every year I know they're going to be there. You know, they bloom there. And then you start looking forward to them. It's kind of like uh, looking forward to an old friend coming back for the holidays. I can go out on a property at certain times and know there'll be certain plants there. Or just this morning I came into work and I rounded a corner to fill the bird feeders out here and there's a red-winged blackbird out in the feeder. Now here's this bird, one of the most common birds in North America. And it's one that in the summertime you just don't even give a second of thought because they're everywhere down in the marshes. But here we are in the middle of February and it's a real treat because it's back. You know, it's, to me it's a harbinger of spring more than a 
uh, what a robin might be for many people. It really signals that uh, there's a change in the air. And so in the world when there's so much uncertainty and so much craziness, uh, there's certain things you can count on, and that's nature. And you can find those things here. And uh, I find those things every day when I come to work.